My name is Mia Navarro. I use she, her pronouns. I work for the city of Tacoma and I am the assistant director of the Office of Equity and Human Rights. And I'm here today to talk about putting equity into practice. And I'm going to share my, share my screen before I get going. Um, just need to back it up. All right, thanks for your patience there for that moment. So uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been working in the nonprofit and public sector since about 2003, so going on 20 years um, in that space. Started my career in housing and homelessness and then have been moving into the, the municipal equity space since about 2016. And I'm currently working, I, I have an MBA, but I'm currently working on a PhD in leadership studies um, with uh, St. Martin's University. And it's been a really great, fantastic experience so far that I have really enjoyed. Um, so um, there's a lot of organizations that are working on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, a lot of training, a lot of conversations happening. What I find in my experience at my organization is um, sort of want people wanting to take that next step from taking in all this information and wanting to understand how to apply it into into our everyday work into our programs and services how do we make our program services and outcomes more equitable so my goal today is that after attending this lunch and learn you you will hopefully be able to name and describe some of the basic steps for operationalizing equity or putting that equity into practice apply those steps to a practice scenario, and then I'm going to share a short list of resources that may help you in future projects. And before we begin, there are some things that are really, really critical to keep in mind. But the first one is that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. If we in organizations are um, trying to do this problem solving without consulting those who are most impacted, then then we're really, really kind of operating in a space of um, of saviorism or paternalism, right? Where we as the organization know best. We have this problem. We have a lot of smart people working on it. I'm sure we can fix it, but we don't have people who are actually impacted by the problem. We're going to miss a lot of things. The second piece that I want to point out is... Um, is to really be thinking about systems versus individuals in these issues, right? So coming from the housing field, um, I, I always felt like um, the, the challenges that the organizations I would work for were running into or um, trying to solve homelessness, right? Or, or, or those, kinds of, those kinds of issues. We look at individuals, right? Rather than the systems that are creating the outcomes for individuals. So as we're as we're as as you're doing this work, important to look at how the systems are creating the outcomes that individuals are experiencing. And so then how do we need to change the systems to get different outcomes? There's no one right way. So the tools I'm offering today, um, I hope will be helpful, but I'm not trying to say that this is the only way to do it, right? This is one way, one process to consider. Um, and in any equity work, any equity inclusion, anti-racism work, what we're trying to get away from is that kind of cultural norm saying that there is one right way, because there really isn't. Um, there are so many different ways to be in the world, so many different ways for us to show up, so many different ways for systems to be. It's easy when we work in a system, in an organization, in an institution, to begin to feel like, there's just this one way, this one track, this is how things have always been. And so this is how it has to be, but that's, that's not the case, right? So just keep that in mind as well. It's also important to look at this, to understand this work as adaptive rather than technical work. So a lot of the work in, in, in organizations can be very technical where, um, uh, for example, I'll use the example that's popping into my head right now is is language access. If there's a need for if there's a need for interpretation live, your organization might have that that technical fix of a contract with a language provider that you can call and have that live interpretation happen, or you send a document and get that translated. Right. A more adaptive process is 
understanding as an organization um, how to provide language justice for the people that you serve and what systems and processes and um, ways of being in the organization need to need to change so that we're automatically thinking about language justice and structuring ourselves in a way that is accessible linguistically for everyone that we serve, which takes it's a little bit more right than a contract or a or a or having that policy in place, but it's that sort of larger context. And I and and I think it's important for us to remember that with equity work. Um, I was in a meeting just yesterday, actually, which is part of the reason I wanted to talk about this is, um, you know, doing, and some of you may experience in this, you may experience this in your organizations as well. People are brought in as subject matter experts in equity and um, may be expected to operate within a system or structure where a strategic plan or these very kind of technical fixes are usually in use, right? And when we come in to do this work that is more adaptive, it can it can be a little bit frustrating because we don't have that do this, this, and this, and you're going to get to this outcome. It's much, it's much broader than that. It's much more adaptive. There has to be more um, more flexibility, uh, more nuance, right? More com more complexity um, added into the process. So that's something that's important to remember in this work as well. And then the last the last piece here on this slide is that this work is iterative. So the steps I'm going to share with you, which are based on a model from the Othering and Belonging Institute out of Berkeley, um, it's it's once you go through those steps, it's not going to be a one and done. This this harkens back, I think, to the technical versus adaptive nature, right? So we'll go through those steps. But then as you're sort of monitoring results, you may need to go back and reiterate and continuously improve um, the, the work that you're doing in this space. And finally, um, I share this image of a steamroller um, because ultimately well, this, what this work comes down to is changing the way that we do business. Because as I said before, our systems and structures as they currently exist are getting the outcomes that they get. And so in order to change the outcomes, we need to change the systems. And when I first started doing this work, I kept having this image of a steamroller. We would talk about having a, you know, putting it, using an equity lens, which I think can be helpful imagery. But in my head, I just kept saying, okay, we're going to put a new windshield on this steamroller that says equity lens on it, but it's still a steamroller and it's still going to flatten that road. We're still going to get the same outcome. And so um, that's just a just another another piece of this that I want uh, folks to realize is that um, this work can't be performative, right? This work has to be transformational in the organization. Um, so what I'm about to share with you is not so not a checklist, right? But it's a way to help you change the way that you do business, change the way that you operate to get more equitable outcomes. So this information is, uh, is, is, as I said before, based on the concept of targeted universalism from the Othering and Belonging Institute out of Berkeley. And at the end of the, um, end of the presentation, I have link, a link to um, a lot of resources about that. Um, but these are the basic steps that they outline. And there are other organizations and resources that I reference later in the presentation as well that are similar. Um, but as sort of an introduction, I like these, I like these steps. And again, the first piece of this, right, is that in relationship with those, in collaboration with those closest to the pain, here are the steps um, that can be helpful. So the first, the first one is identify a disparity or an inequity and establish a universal goal. Um, and in that space, what we what we would be doing, for example, and I, I'm going to have some more examples to share um, after this, but um, actually, I'm going to go through these first and then share the examples. The second piece there is to gather data and information. How is the whole population faring? How are individual individual populations faring? So meaning we're going to disaggregate our whole population um, into, for example, race or gender, or race and gender, different demographic uh, demographic identities, so that you can see, even though the whole group may be faring one way, there may be significant differences in how different groups fare um, around this universal goal. Why are there differences? 
this is this is one of the key one of the key pieces. It's important to know that there are differences or disparities, but we have to understand why. And in helping us do that, right, we need to we need to take into account both the numbers, but also the stories and the historical context. And I'll talk more about that again in the in the upcoming examples. Once you've done and, and you see here, I've got these air, air, arrows, because for me, these two are a little bit chicken and the egg, right? Because how can you find your disparity if you're not looking at data, right? So you're going to kind of do those two a little bit concurrently and go back and forth between those to fine tune that universal goal. And then go deeper into the data and the why to help you move on to coming up with targeted strategies that you can, that you can work on in your organization um, in partnership, in relationship with those uh, with those that you serve. And then the last one is measure your progress and continuously improve as you iterate through this process. Um, I think in our organizations, in our in our culture, in our work culture, we often get hung up on finding that perfect solution the first time. And if we fail, we abandon it, and we start over. Um, but if we look at that more continuous improvement model, we know that if we're doing our due diligence and taking strong steps at the beginning to inform a change, and then if maybe it's not working completely, we can we can use information that we have to make make small tweaks and continuously improve to try to improve the outcomes that we're getting. So um, next, I'm I'm going to share a video from the Institute of Othering and Belonging. Um, I just have to change over to a different platform. This will give some more some more examples. What is the most effective and sustainable policy response to problems in our society? Universal approaches are widely used in order to package policies for broad appeal. Universal policies such as Social Security and minimum wage provide the same benefits or minimum protections to everyone, regardless of status or group membership. But by treating everyone the same, universal approaches can't root out group-based discrimination it may actually deepen inequality between groups rather than reduce it. And by providing benefits or protections to everyone, resources that could be targeted to groups worse off instead flow to those who are better off. In contrast to universalism, targeted approaches are commonly used. Targeted policies provide benefits or protections based on group membership or status. SNAP, the food stamp program, conditions benefits on income level. The Americans with Disabilities Act requires public accessibility for disabled groups. And affirmative action focuses on historically disadvantaged groups. Targeted approaches are vulnerable to the critique that they unfairly favor constituent groups over the public good by directing resources to marginalized groups who are already subjected to unfair stereotypes. But universal and targeted approaches are false choices. There is a third way, targeted universalism. Targeted universalism means setting universal goals that can be achieved through targeted approaches. This approach targets the various needs of each group while reminding us that we are all part of the same social fabric. This can be accomplished by following five steps. First, set a universal goal. For example, 100% proficiency in eighth grade math. Second, measure how the overall population fares relative to the universal goal. In this example, we might discover that only 80% of 8th graders are proficient in 8th grade math. Third, measure the performance of population segments relative to the universal goal. So although 80% of all 8th graders are proficient, we might find that only 70% of Latinx students are proficient. Fourth, understand how structures and other factors support or impede groups' progress toward the universal goal. For our Latinx students, classroom instruction materials and lessons designed for English speakers may impede learning, including math proficiency. Finally, 
implement targeted strategies so that each and every group can achieve the universal goal based upon their needs and circumstances. This may take the form of ESL-specific math tutoring for our Latinx students, while another group may require a completely different strategy to achieve the same universal goal. Targeted universalism rejects a blanket universal, which may be indifferent to the reality that different groups are situated differently relative to the institutions and resources of society. By aspiring toward shared universal goals, targeted universalism empowers targeted strategies capable of achieving those goals while moving us beyond concerns over disparities alone and toward our highest aspirations for all. All right, now I'm gonna go back to the slides. All right, so now I'm going to share a local example. Um, this, is, this is pretty recent from our Tacoma Fire Department. Um, they were looking at their, the um, cardiac arrest outcomes in different areas of the city. And what they were noticing was that in air, you know, in in an instance of a cardiac arrest, if it was witnessed by a bystander, and the bystander performed CPR, the outcome was much better for the person who experienced the heart attack, the cardiac arrest. So then, they took that information a step further and wanted to see where in the city. They, so they were noticing differences in outcomes of cardiac arrest uh, patients. And um, they, so they plotted this on a map and they then correlated as well um, whether or not the bystander performed CPR. And what they found was that um, you see it, the, the red stars are areas where there was a bystander, but the bystander did not perform CPR. And the green stars are areas where there was a bystander and they did perform CPR. And you can see a geographic difference, right? So they were identifying this disparity and inequity and establishing a universal goal. They wanna see cardiac arrest outcomes look the same across the city. They found that that was not the case, that in certain geographic areas, that this was happening, there was there was bystander CPR happening in other areas there was not. So there, so then they moved on and wanted to gather more data and information. Um, that historical context is is so important that the the video mentioned and that I mentioned in the earlier slide to understand why we have this geographic difference in the city of Tacoma and many other cities um, has to do with historical practices such as redlining. Um, if you were to overlay this map onto a redlining map or other maps that the city has um, with data, you're going to see these kinds of geographic disparities play out. And so what the fire department found was that areas that have historically been disinvested in are continuing to experience that. And then we're seeing this negative health come, outcome as a, as, a, as a result. So based on based on this geographic difference in, um, in bystander CPR and then correlated uh, cardiac outcomes, they, they decided to, um, I'm actually, so then, so then they moved on to look at uh, their targeted strategies and try them out and then measure progress and continuously improve. And I'm gonna move to the next slide here, which shows um, a little bit more of the data that they, um, that they pulled and found that not only were the outcomes different by geography, but they were also significantly different by race. Um, and they found that 70% of, um, of Caucasian race car cardiac arrest receive um, bystander CPR, but only 11% of, of non-white race car cardiac arrest receive citizen CPR. So this is having a, a racial, a, a, a disparate impact racially as well. And so 
one of the one of the ways that they are working on changing this outcome is that they are targeting their CPR training in these in these areas. So one at, one at Foss High School in Tacoma, in Central Tacoma, and then also the East Side Community Center, to try to change those geographic and racial disparities. Um, we're still um, they're still collecting data and in, in that you know data to measure progress and see if these outcomes are changing, um, and as they do that, they will then continue to iterate and 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 try to um, you know work with community and see what's going on um, in this space to understand you know if 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 results are changing or not and what might what what else might need to change. So I am going to I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions and feel free to come off mute and ask or put it into the chat. I will recommend if um, if you have a question you'd like to come off mute to ask uh, via the, the microphone, please raise your hand first, just so that if there are multiple people, we can kind of manage that. Otherwise, the chat box is open. All right, I'm not seeing hands and I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So I'm going to move on. But if anything pops into your mind, please do feel free to to put that into the chat. So now we have we have a oh. we have a last minute. Uh, so Sweet. Kelly Baymeyer asked in this example, did the fire department go through the steps that were outlined? If, for example, asking those most impacted. Yes, so that, thank you for bringing that up. I um, the fire department has a uh, a community sort of a citizen advisory group that they work with on uh, on issues like this. And so I believe this was um, this was taken to that group as they were um, working on their solution. Is there a good resource for uh... Is there a good source for resources like redlining maps? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. I do have that as one of my resources at the end um, in, in one of the last slides. So um, I don't think I included City of Tacoma's uh, specific redlining map, but I do have a link to the Mapping Inequality Project, which um, shows all of the redlining maps across the country with all of the detail of the area descriptions and the history behind it and, and whatnot. So yes, that, that, that information is available. And another, another uh, source of data that I'll talk about a little bit more later is the City of Tacoma's Equity Index map. That is another great resource for helping in this kind of analysis. All right, and then I have a technical question. When I pull up the chat, can you see it or are you just see my slides? Just your slides. Okay, good. We're good. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so now is the moment where um, we will break into into small groups. Um, we'll start. We can. We'll start with. Uh, I have two examples that we can work on in small groups. We might only have time for one, um, because it's twelve thirty. Um, yeah, so we'll probably we'll probably only have time for one. Um, but the this data set right here is um, where we it's just an example data set that you could work with and to sort of practice these four steps. Um, and I'll, I'll just describe this this data set. So this is from probably about 2019 or so. Um, but the city of Tacoma, one of our goals is for the workforce to reflect the community that we serve. And so we're monitoring that for ourselves to, so, to show um, where is our workforce percentages by race and by gender as well. Um, I have that on a different slide. Um, compared to how, excuse me, how these different demographics show up in the community. And so this is, this is, this data is a little bit old, but it was uh, publicly available. So that's what I was trying to use um, as, as an example today, publicly available data. So you can see here the light blue bar represents the percentage in the city of Tacoma workforce. The dark blue bar represents um, this the demographic percentage in the community. 
And then the green and purple sort of break down the city of Tacoma workforce into general government departments versus Tacoma public utilities. They're a little bit separate in, in our in our structure. And you can look at those in your example or not, but the main the main thing, right, is we're we're comparing the workforce demographics to the demographics in the community. And so um, you would you were gonna take these four steps and just sort of I'm going to, I'll put them into the chat so you have them in, in, to reference in your small group. And so you're just going to sort of brainstorm what, what would a universal goal be in this, in this instance? Um, what other data and information would you want to gather? And, and, um, Oh gosh, as I realized, I should have added 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 one here. How will you how will you engage those most impacted by the disparity in um, in understanding why the disparity exists and in in coming up with those targeted strategies? Um, so, and then how would you how would you measure your progress moving forward? So, in your small group, you're gonna you're gonna use this as an example. Um, and I don't think I have a way to send this snippet in the in the in the chat. So if you want to take a picture, a screenshot of it, uh, probably... depending on your version of Zoom, mm -hmm. Mia, we uh, we should be able to share the screen to the breakout rooms now. Oh, okay, um, cool. Yes. Um, so, how long would you like to give folks? Let's start with ten minutes, um, just for the sake of time. And remember, this doesn't have to be super in depth. This is just to get you thinking about. Uh, just do a quick brainstorm on these on these items. Um, so uh, let me let me put into the chat the prompts. Yeah, so. and while Mia is doing that, um, we will go into these breakout rooms. There will be about three to five people in each breakout room. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself and do all of that. Um, and uh, the rooms will close automatically after 10 minutes. So when you get that notice that, um, that the room is closing, closing, please make sure you uh, wrap up your last few things and um, get ready to head back into the, the large room. All right, and with that, I will go ahead and open those rooms. Thank you. Please click that blue join button when it comes up for you. And Sarah Lynn. All right, welcome back. And I, uh, I didn't mention before, but what I'd love for you all to do is to just, and this is optional, but would love to hear just one thing from each group that wants to report out. You don't have to report out on all of your steps. I don't think we have time for that, but would just love to hear any, any particular takeaway or question or, um, or, or what part of this sort of like, uh, or, or what did you brainstorm, something you brainstormed that was that was particularly exciting or 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 worrisome, right? So we'd love to hear from each group. Um, and I don't have the groups now, but. Well, you just I wanna, believe, yeah, go for it, sorry. I, I believe we were in number one and okay. um, anybody in the number one group that was with me, you know, chime in. But uh, we talked about the disparity being that there's, more white, uh, and these are employment, right? These are people in the jobs. Is this correct? Uh -huh. Correct. Okay, so that, yeah, we're seeing that there's more white people in all of these uh, communities of work. And um, so we thought the universal goal was to get more people of color, uh, more diversity into all these uh, jobs. And so we said that the app, information was here, but um, we we're working on the targeted strategies. One of them I thought that was really important was networking, because a lot of times, you know, people of color don't know who to, don't know people in the businesses that they want to get into. 
I thought that was really good. Um, also mentoring for those people who are coming into these programs that are maybe uh, have never been in, in these areas of work. And um, because I work with immigrants and refugees, I was saying to recognize the credentials of foreign trained mm. um, individuals, as well as those who have done, who have the experience, but not the letters behind their names to prove that they have the experience. And so measurement came with um, maybe with the mentors, um, maybe with, um, you know, uh, just at seeing how they're doing it, especially those people who, who have the experience, but not, they don't have the um, education behind them to see how they're doing and mm -hmm. to give them, you know, give them more um, opportunity for uh, continuing education and things like that. So um, great. But we also said, geez, we see this in not just these agencies, but all over the place. Uh huh. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Room Run, and thank you, Cheryl, for for reporting out. Um, and and again, this is optional. Uh, room two. I have Amanda, Maddie, and Melissa. You can say pass too. All right, I'm going to move on to room three, Christina, Stephanie, Toy, and Veronica. Yeah, um, so we uh, agree with the, uh, you know, the universal goal of having equity in the hiring practices. Um, and so really, one of the first data elements you'll want to look at is what are those hiring practices? What are the questions being used? Who's comprised on the panels? Um, how are the jobs being announced? Is there, you know, distribution uh, equitably through all sorts of networks? So really just kind of evaluating that whole process of how the employees are hired into the system. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, room four, Mary and Mindy. So um, when I looked at this, I maybe I took a different spin on it. Uh -huh. um, I looked at it and said, like, starting with identify the disparity as my overall um, item that we need to think about. Uh, this is what it is overall. Now let's start gathering data for my specific positions that I may mm -hmm. need, whether that is... Uh, where I work, I do production uh, for videos. So we create videos for different companies. So what producers are in the area and, all, and what is the what does that look like from a racial or equity uh, foundation? Because it may be different. We may not have as many Black, Hispanic, so forth and so on in the area. So start looking at that, getting down to some specific information as I gather more data. Uh, and then look at strategies to not only look at like the workforce, but look at, because Tacoma has a large military base, look at the people that are there because when you have people who are in the military, they have families and friends that may know information that you need, as well as the schools, whether it's community colleges or the universities or different associations that may be in the area uh, that you can use to the point down to the United Way because they mm -hmm. do things and have people that you may not automatically know and not just rely, because I hate when people rely on LinkedIn, it irritates me to no end. <laughs> like, not everybody looks at LinkedIn, because I have a LinkedIn account, I can tell you, I look at it maybe once every three months. I right, get I'm it. the same. <laughs> uh, so looking at different things, and you mm -hmm. won't get me if, if you were looking at an association like SHRM, because I've been in human resources for 30 years. So I would be more in a SHRM than LinkedIn, because mm -hmm. LinkedIn is becoming uh, more for vendors than anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that. So how can you think outside that box? Right. Uh, then start, once you have, have your avenues decided that you're going to use and being open to new avenues, 
then you can start measuring how those avenues are working and adjust when necessary. So I, I started looking at it from the purely hiring staffing point of view, going like, here's what I want to do. Here's where I need to gather information for the positions that are in my company, because not everybody can do every job. Right. Uh, and then not necessarily look at the education piece, because like the young lady said, uh, we may have people who don't have a U.S. educational certification, but that does not mean they cannot do the job. Uh, so start looking at those types of things and then you can start measuring and start to continuously improve and you will see those numbers adjust. But you have to start with the broad and then work down to specific. That's great. Thank you so much. All right, room five, I have Dr. Pritchett, Michelle, and Sean. I apologize uh, if I'm getting names wrong. No, you have it right. Um, uh, my name is Sean uh, Nicholson. And um, yeah, we identified the disparity, which we thought was the disproportionate whites uh, in the city of Tacoma workforce. Uh, we um, uh, looked at a um, universal targeted goal about working toward having our community uh, better represented in the workforce. Um, and then the additional data that we wanted to collect is uh, we wanted to see the demographics of the employees. Um, we also uh, wanted to look to see if they have any DEI goals for their recruitment, right? So before we just simply go in and tell, uh, you know, the employers <laughs> at these different organizations what uh, the universal targeted goal is, uh, we maybe should uh, actually talk to them and find out what kind of um, goals they already have in place uh, and, and work with them cooperatively. Um, as far as reaching out, we talked about um, looking at other major employers, like others have said, to see what the mix looks like around there, right? Because the, the mix could be very similar. And if it is, you know, understanding why it's similar or why there's maybe discrepancies with other major employers in the area. So that's in, something to look at. Uh, we wanted to be able to reach out to uh, other employers in the city. Like I said, we reach out to city employees to get their thoughts about the disparity. So once again, not just dictating <laughs> a universal targeted role. We're talking about the people being affected, right? Getting close mm -hmm. to them. Go talk to the, the employees, you know. Mm -hmm. and do you feel that your workplace is diverse? Do you, do you feel comfortable working in your, your workplace, right? Find out what's going on with them before you set uh, a, some targeted goal for them. And then reaching out to the community. Uh, one of the things we do down here in Oregon <laughs> is uh, we have these community-based organizations. I'm sure you do too, uh, for all of these different types of um, uh, groups that you have listed here. And, and we reach out to them on a regular basis to talk to them about all kinds of things. You know, everything from COVID to uh, uh, food stamps to you name it. Um, we reach out to them and talk to them about what their thoughts and ideas are about how um, we can work together to to meet you know the goals of the community and then finally the measuring the uh, the progress we talked about uh making smart goals right so the smart right <laughs> very important right and 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 i love that uh, michelle talked about you know even maybe thinking about that before we reach out so we have some kind of foundation to say hey these are some of the things that we're thinking about uh, and she also made the point that it's really important that we include the stakeholders as we are measuring the progress so that the, the, the active participants in, uh, in, in the understanding of as we're gathering the information. So that's what we came up with in the short period of time we had to work with. <laughs> yes, great. Thank you. You all, you all have done great in that tiny, tiny 10 minutes. All right. And then last room, Columba, Gwenalisa, and Thomas. Hello, folks. And uh, so uh this is Thomas Ginsburg, uh, and uh, thanks everyone for all, all your insights and conversation. This has just been uh, very appreciative, very meaningful, and very impactful. Uh, we talked about two major issues. Uh, one is that we have a workforce that doesn't represent our community, so we want our communities to see themselves in the workforce. Uh, <clears throat> Gwenalisa came up with a very good global idea is that we have to analyze our mission and our values to make sure that they are aligning and resonating with the communities, uh, much like uh, in employing the, the tools and uh, data collection strategies and intent, building the intentional relationships that Sean mentioned. And then the other is uh, going very granular in the hiring process itself was addressing the implicit biases of the uh, recruitment, the recruiters and the interviewers and removing as much of that uh, data 
that would uh, that would cause that implicit bias to come into action that's passing over uh, these qualified candidates. Uh, so you may actually have a very talented and diverse applicant pool based on your outreach, but if your interview panel uh, is deselecting those folks based on their implicit biases, you're going to find that you're having a lot of people drop out and then continue it on through the interview stage. So if you have a pool of diverse and qualified candidates, why are they dropping out and uh, uh, declining uh, job offers? Uh, so that's uh, what we discussed. Great. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, everyone, for participating in that, in that exercise. I know it wasn't a lot of time, but I wanted to make sure you all had the opportunity to kind of practice with, with these concepts and think through them. Um, when it comes to workforce, I would just add it's there's there's the hiring piece, but then there's also the retention piece, right? So do you do you have a workplace culture that is retaining um, employees that reflect the community as well? So I'm going to just really quickly move through the rest of these slides just to show you that they're there. Um, Sarah Lynn is going to be sending this information out so you will have it. Um, I went back to that one. Just be uh, some other sources of information that might be helpful. If you have employee data that you can disaggregate, you have customer data you can disaggregate. Those are other really um, important sources of data to, to mine. And then um, here's that list of resources. This is Tacoma's. I did put in the city of Tacoma's redlining map. That's the original map from 1937. And then on the left there, you have links to um, the Othering and Belonging Institute and their work on targeted universalism. Race Forward, Policy Link, and the Government Alliance on Race and Equity are um, organizations that we consult with uh, often. They've been very helpful. They have a lot of great tools and resources. Um, there's the Mapping Inequality is that next one. And then Opportunity Mapping, you see there a link to the City of Tacoma Equity Index, which includes all of Pierce County now and Tacoma Public Utilities Service Areas. And then the Kerwin Institute, who is the um, the 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 folks that helped us initially get get started with that um and i apologize i'm taking us right up to the end but it's been a pleasure being with you today thank you so much i learned a lot today about conducting a lunch and learn in about this content as well so um thank you all so much for your participation and um i uh and we've got the the feedback here from from sarah lynn and um hope i'll see you all again sometime um, I will uh, invite if um, if there are folks who do want to spend a couple more minutes, if Mia has a couple more minutes, um, mm -hmm. that, that we can open that up for questions, but I know a lot of folks have to get right back to it. So I will ask that you please uh, fill out the feedback, um, the very short feedback survey that's up there. Um, a couple of other things. Um, is that if you would like to continue engaging in this work with us, um, we are expanding our DEI offerings. Um, we have a workshop coming up on December 7th on uh, unpacking failed DEI efforts. Um, and then we have a number of offerings coming in the spring, including, or the winter, excuse me, including the return of one of our um, previously most popular workshops that really started us down this track, which is race, power, and social impact within nonprofits. Um, which will be taught in the winter by the wonderful um, KJ Williams. Um, so we're very excited about that. Also, just on the piece of um, process, you know, continuous improvement, we offer a suite of process improvement programs um, that, was, that was completely accidental. Um, I didn't know that uh, Mia was going to talk about that, but if you are interested in learning more about actual frameworks for working through process improvement and continuous improvement, um, we have those as well. Uh, I will be sending out.